personal thanks from me, but also on behalf of Flint Mill in English, it's a, it's a joy to see so many of you here. Uh, and having made it here, uh, accept the welcome from me, please, and welcome yourself here. Take a breath with me. Feel the ground beneath your feet. Thank you for complimenting the decoration behind me. I uh, brought this tree in celebration of the uh, production that I'm making at the moment. Um, my house is filled with actors that are uh, involved in it. I'll tell you about the production later. Um, as uh, Will said, I'm an actor and a, a theatre producer. And whenever I start a session with um, actors or children or students or members of the public, whatever session it is, I always start with a check in. So I invite uh, you all now to put a word into the chat box here, a word to describe your year, a word to describe your 2022, a word to describe how you're feeling today, turbulent, productive, wonderful, great words, challenging, mm, those that came up this morning, low, overflowing, surprising, mm, hectic, awesome, Exhausted, tired, busy. Keep them coming, please. Stable, a bit drunk. <laughs> Good. Well, you know, everything in moderation. Busy, busy, busy. Lots of busy bees. Thank you. Keep them coming in if you'd like to check in to describe your year in a word. Ah, uh, in this, uh, the next 25 minutes. I'm going to share with you some of my experiences and some of my reflections of a life in pursuit of the arts, a life in pursuit of connection, a life in pursuit of communication, and how kindness grateful. Love that one. How kindness and gratitude in all their expressions can be nurtured and nourished through radical innovation and the wide open blue sky imaginative invitation of creativity. Now, uh, as uh, Will said, uh, as I just said, I am an actor, I am an author, I am a producer of theatre, I make theatre happen, uh, often more increasingly in uh, communities around the world. And mostly, but not always, uh, I am writing or acting or producing Shakespeare theatre or Shakespeare books or Shakespeare parts, um, but I must come clean from the get-go. I left school hating Shakespeare. It was an arts institution that set me onto my path that has led me here with you today. And finding myself on an artistic path led me to hone the crafts of listening and of empathy, the learned trait of empathy. And from my very privileged position as a white male living in the United Kingdom, I, from what I can hear, from what I see, from what people tell me, from what I feel, it seems that the world is hurting. It feels that we don't have the tools to deal with what has happened to us all during the last few years. Does this year feel harder to you than the last? Permacrisis is the Collins Dictionary's word of the year for 2022. Permacrisis is defined as an extended period of instability and insecurity. In the UK, apparently by our choice, we have Brexit. Around the world, there is COVID still, war, climate disaster, economy disaster, political instability, global insecurity. In the UK, many, many different types of strikes, all worthy. And amongst my friends and colleagues, a sense of impending doom but it's felt like that a long time. 
Are we stuck? Are we all stuck in a post-pandemic fight, flight response? Have we normalized it? According to a survey of UK teachers, nine out of 10 teachers have seen an increase in workload in the last year. Other half have said it has increased significantly with full-time teachers working 57 hours a week in a typical midterm week. Teachers who took part in the poll said they had spent more time on pastoral care, looking after their students, admin, teaching, remote learning and dealing with parents. More than four out of five teachers believe that their job has adversely affected their mental health in the last year, with over half citing workload as the key factor. Perhaps this is familiar. Lockdown has had a devastating effect on us. The losses were huge, not just of life, although those were great and deep and terribly damaging. But the reassurance that we gained once from physical touch was amputated from us without anesthetic. The arenas that we grouped together in, to laugh in, to grieve in, to heal together in, the theatres, the music venues, the sports venues, the religious venues, were closed off from us. How do we repair the effect of all of that loss when we have no idea what damage has been done to us, let alone from living and learning online? Does everyone feel to be in a place of grim survival, of rage, of burning grief? The next pandemic is one of mental health and we're all in it right now. Is that our future? Is that the future of the generations that are coming up after us, that we're teaching? We are preparing our younglings for global citizenship. Now, whether that citizenship is, or globality is uh, geographical, business, virtual, emotional, the world is so linked and we are overwhelmed with information on a daily basis. What skills do people need to thrive? What skills do we need to thrive at life in the global world? We need an education system that's based on need rather than expectation. We need to teach children to communicate effectively. We need to encourage critical thinking and thought. We need to encourage emotionally and rationally thinking for oneself, to be adept at scientific reasoning and navigating emotions. We can't give freedom to the next generation, but we need to give them the safety to enable themselves to go out and find their own freedom. We need to teach the next generation how to listen, to work meaningfully with others, to problem solve, to imagine solutions and to think free from constraints and to celebrate the different types of thinking created by neurodiverse brains. We need to accept that neurodiversity is not a spectrum, but a sphere and we're all in it. We are all wired differently from each other. Here's a quote about one of the greatest minds that we've known and how it was wired. Darwin confessed that his brain was not constructed for much thinking and wisely gave up the attempt to use it for the pursuance of his specialist subjects for more than an hour or so at a time. Had he not done so, much of his invaluable work might never have seen the light. If someone of Darwin's gigantic intellect found it impossible to concentrate his attention for any lengthy period without fatigue, surely allowance should be made for children who doubtless suffer as he did. Yet bright, intelligent children are often expected to concentrate their attention for many hours at a time, and when they fail, are regarded as simply lazy. This was Leonard Guthrie, a physician and pediatrician, in 1909. How much have things changed? Our next generations need to be celebrated for their strengths, not punished for their weaknesses. 
Endlessly testing children in the three R's is exclusionary and reductive. It isn't accessible for all neurotypes, and its sharp aim arrows a beeline of producing folk best skilled to grow the economy, a worthy thing in a capitalist world built on exponential growth. But it's not the only way. As Jason Hickel, the author of Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World, says, Exponential growth is going to kill us one day, and we need creative thinking to imagine a different sort of global future. Sir Ken Robinson, the great educationalist, said, creativity is as important in education as literacy. And Peter Gabriel, the artist and singer, said, creativity comes from the freedom to fail. And the freedom to fail comes from, you know, experimentation. And that's what gives someone their individuality. The freedom to fail and experimentation. We need to celebrate risk taking more. Now, I learned that this was an OK thing to do, to take risks and to fail in a theatre. Theatre is a place, one of our first places and one of our last places, where we're encouraged to inhabit the thoughts and feelings of people radically different from ourselves. Theatre is the powerhouse of empathy. As our mirror neurons sing inside of us, the mirror neurons, the magic parts of our human brains that spark empathy, that help us walk a mile, in another's shoes that help us see others go through something emotional and make us feel a little of what they experience. Theatre has empowered me and has taught me about team building and collaboration. As Ruth Brock, the ex-CEO of the Shakespeare Schools Foundation, which uh, uh, encourages students around the country to perform Shakespeare, in their teens, she said, the act of putting on a play, the coming together, the creativity, the imagination, the failures, the conquering of fears, and the doing it anyway. As the saying goes, drama is not therapy, but it can be therapeutic. Chris Sonix, the artistic director of the theatre company Cardboard Citizens, yesterday announced that he has set up Ticket Bank. Now, uh, I should say that Chris's theatre company Cardboard Citizens creates work with and for people who experience homelessness, inequity or poverty. Ticket Bank, the institution that he set up yesterday, gives unsold theatre, music, comedy and dance tickets to people struggling with the cost of living. Chris said, there are brilliant people putting together food banks and heat banks, but that doesn't give humanity its basic needs from a soul point of view. People who are suffering as a result of the cost of living also need access to community, entertainment, and things that warm the soul. Art is a human right. And the tighter things get with people's finances, the more they will be squeezed out of art. Indeed, the artist Anthony Gormley recently, well, a few years ago now, tried to take some art to Sarajevo. And this was what his response was to the Foreign Office's opinion that he should not. The Foreign Office said it was immoral to take art when what was needed was food. That's a very limited view of what is necessary for the spirit. It was in theater, not education, that I found one of my greatest teachers in Shakespeare, in, in Shakespeare's writing. His writings have taught me empathy. They've encouraged my creativity. They've expanded my imagination. They have given great grounding and foundation to my compassion and exercised my reasoning. 
they haven't perhaps taught me so much about conflict resolution, but still, Shakespeare, there's room for improvement. Having taught me all of these things, I now know that there's a place I can go, a body of work that captures so much of what we, I, of what I need to thrive. You can't sleep, waking up in the middle of the night, full of woes, of troubles. There is a place you can go, a sandbox of human emotions, a safe place to explore saying the wildest and most extreme things you've ever felt or thought. And I have heard it said, unbidden guests are often welcomest when they are gone. Society is no comfort to one not sociable. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Grief makes one hour ten. And that deep torture may be called a hell when more is felt than one hath power to tell. Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. My tongue will tell the anger of my heart or else my heart concealing it will break. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it and sets it light. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. In nature, there's no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind. Tis in ourselves that we are thus or thus. Our bodies are our gardens, to the which our wills are gardeners. Self-love is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. The worst is not, so long as we can say, this is the worst. The miserable have no other medicine but only hope. The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill, together. Yes, yes, Shakespeare, I have felt like this. Shakespeare makes me feel seen. Theatre made me feel open to the idea of therapy and meditation and mindfulness. Therapy helped me heal my griefs that I'd been carrying. Therapy made me ready for the deeper lessons Shakespeare teaches. You all, I'm sure, have heard the phrase, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. I slightly prefer the third century Confucian philosopher Sun Zi's version. Having heard of it is not as good as having seen it. Having seen it is not as good as knowing it. Knowing it is not as good as putting it into practice. That, for me, is a call, not just to theatre, not just to creativity, but to artistic expression, which can so often be the gateway to the healing act of compassion and to the learned trait of empathy, to kindness, in other words. Compassion, to have active concern for the misfortune and suffering of others, and empathy, the basic tool of the artist, the ability to see the world through the eyes of others. Barack Obama once said, it's the power of empathy, not as an end all, a be all, because even after you've listened to somebody or seen them, they still have a concrete problem. They've lost their house, they've lost their job, 
But what this form of story sharing and empathy and listening does is it creates the conditions around which we can then have a meaningful conversation and sort through our differences and our challenges and arrive at better decisions because we've been able to hear everybody. Everybody feels heard so that even if a decision's made that they don't completely agree with, then at least they feel like, okay, I was a part of this. This wasn't just dumped on me. Empathy and compassion are the building blocks of community and global citizenship. The arts are an excellent means to express yourself, to process your feelings, and to give space, a safe space, for others to express themselves and to process their own feelings. Speaking, writing, painting, sculpting, dance, music, whatever art form resonates. Art invites us to use our life experiences, to combine them with our imagination and to form on the page the words or the ink or the palette or the clay or the form or the musical notes. The act of channeling your view through artistic expression is one of inherent generosity. It's a sharing of vulnerability. And vulnerability is our first universal language through which we can channel our view into a visceral experience, into a physical experience, into an aural experience. The Ukrainian artist Alexei Sai said, my goal is to terrify people, to show that the war is total, to show that it's fucking serious. It's too scary for news, but for art, it's possible. It's not propaganda. It's not the stuff I want to do. It's the stuff I need to do. It is practical and useful, and people change their minds about the war. It worked. I'm practicing kindness through art today. I have moved to a town in North Wales where there's not been theatre, and as a theatre practitioner, that could be an obstacle to living here. But I've decided to turn that obstacle into an opportunity and I found some help and to make a theatre production of Charles Dickens, not Shakespeare, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol happened this week. We performed for the first time last night. We'll perform again twice today, twice tomorrow, twice on Saturday and again on Sunday in three communities in North Wales and everything is entirely free free for all who want to come, an opportunity for coming together, for laughing together, for crying together, for raising a glass together because we've managed to make sure that everyone gets a nice warm hot drink and something to eat at the same time, and to share a bit of festive spirit, no matter your belief that this time of year is an opportunity to let go of hate and hurt and to hold each other and to be together on this rock. We must learn to facilitate permission and agency and ownership and creativity and articulate the freedom and necessity to fail and to fail again. And as Beckett says, Samuel Beckett, to fail better. We need to gift inspiration, imagination and oracy to our next generations. We need to challenge ourselves and each other. We need to scale impossibly high mountains for no other reason than because they are there to be climbed. Maybe because from the vantage point of these highest peaks, we can gain a clearer perspective of what it is to be human. Thank you. And just as we began the session, checking in with a word. I invite each of you now to reinforce this session with a word in the chat box, a word or a phrase that captures the session for you, something that you want to take with you, something that you want to leave behind you. Well, thank you for coming, I thank you for listening. Uh, 
I don't know how you do it, Ben, but every time <laughs> you manage to move me again. <laughs> I'm going to repeat what I did this morning already, which is that I'm going to remove the silly paraphernalia <laughs> for a moment in honor of what we've heard, because I think it's, it's too serious um, and too profound, really. Uh, to do anything but <laughs> and uh, as was the case in the morning i'm just looking at the numerous notes i've taken and uh, you know to do something different from from what i did in the morning um the quote that that i think stood out for me massively uh, uh, this time around is is the one from uh, peter gabriel where you said uh, that uh, creativity comes from uh, the freedom to fail. And I, I think it's, again, as we talked about it in the morning already, it's such a beautiful uh, thought that invites instant parallels with education. Yeah, uh, uh, learning comes from freedom to fail. Um, uh, it's so important to remember that, and not just in the time of, in, you know, holiday celebration, but when uh, um, uh, everyday reality kicks back in and uh, we somehow need to continue to relate to these people. I think this is super important. And another thing that, that uh, uh, again, it just stood out in my notes so much was, was this idea of, of uh, uh, doing something anyway, doing mm. something when uh, the initial spirit of, uh, of enthusiasm is long gone, right? And, and you continue doing it because it, you feel that this is something of value. And you know, you've reminded me of something that uh, my Polish colleagues uh, will instantly recognize, uh, um, the late uh, a poet uh, um, uh, Młynarski, a wonderful poet. He, he produced, you know, in the time of solidarity, in the time of uh, of, of Poland uh, rising again from from uh, communist oppression, he came up with this in, in, in incredible poem in which uh, uh, the final lines or the, or the the key lines in Polish were "Rób swoje, let's just do our own thing. And if we do, then a few tiny details might survive. Uh, and the tiny details that he uh, mentioned were uh, culture, art, and freedom of speech. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, in your honor, I, I, I did a very um, um, amateurish and, and probably embarrassing uh, uh, paraphrase of that. And then the paraphrase in your honor is mm. uh, a few tiny details might still survive art, culture and uh, the will to thrive oh. uh, and I just, and I just uh, uh, yeah I mean this is a way to say thank you from us all from uh, uh, for sharing what you've shared with us in the morning and, and in, in the afternoon today so have a, a wonderful uh, holiday season you and your loved ones and I we do hope we see you a lot <laughs> in 2023. Me on too. many occasions. Much love to, to you all, Gregor, and to your family, and to Will and Louise, and everyone out there. Um, uh, peace and, and goodwill to all. Merry Christmas. <laughs>